Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the uh, first Western Washington Tableau user group of the 22-23 school year. You know, it's still semester one here, so I feel like we, we made it <laughs> some kind of time. Uh, my name is Ashley Berkland. I'm the Executive Director of Organizational Effectiveness in the Kent School District. Um, all that to say that I uh, lead the teams of data services, research, technology, and strategy, which also includes project management. Um, and data visualization fits into that world under our research team and the data analysts there. Um, I've been leading this team, this group for the last few years. I don't know how many now. Um, for those of you that are new, we try to meet quarterly. It's been a while, we're a little off cadence, so we'll try to right size that. But it's just a time to get together with some of our surrounding school districts and other partners that are outside of the K-12 space and share what we're working on and what might be good for all of us to know and to keep building our skills. So um, with that, I'm just gonna give a little bit of an overview of our agenda. Um, so do welcome and introductions. We have the Renton School District that's gonna take us through a course taking patterns using Sankey charts. Uh, presentation. And then really, we just have time for open discussion. I know in Kent, we have a couple things that we want to share just more informally and get some feedback on. Um, you know, that offer is open to any of you, like questions, things you want to share, any of that. Um, so we'll have some time to do that. We may get done early, we may not, you know, it just depends on what where the discussion goes. And then uh, closing and next steps. So just looking at how many of us are here, there's 16 of us. We don't have a huge agenda. So, oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Here's the, uh, for the introductions, um, name, district or institution where you're coming from, um, title, and then if you had to eat one meal for the rest of the year, what would it be? So we have a fairly small group. So if you come off mute and introduce yourself, that'd be great. We, then we can get started. I'm thinking if I'm, I've done all of them except for one meal. Um, I think that maybe for me, it would be uh, tacos, that I could do tacos for the rest of the year. Well, then you can hand it off to me. Sure. I'm David Ogden. I'm from the Renton School District where I am the assessment facilitator. Uh, we've been using Tableau for, what was it, 2015, 16, something like that. And um, thank you, Brian, also from the Red School Circuit. Uh, and if I had to eat one meal for the rest of the year, it would be peanut butter and jelly. I really like peanut butter and jelly, but you know, I haven't had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich in a really long time. <laughs> I, uh, I could go the rest of the year with peanut butter and jelly. And I'll hand it off to Brian Chu over there uh, in the Seattle School District. Thank you, David. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Brian Chu. I'm with the Seattle Public School, and um, I'm the senior data scientist on the research and evaluation team. Um, we primarily work with Power BI, but do some work in Tableau as well. Um, and if I could eat one meal for the rest of the year, I would choose uh, chicken teriyaki. Um, and then I'll pass it to Brian, or Brian Goddard. Hey there, uh, I'm Brian Goddard, and I'm also through in school district. Like David said, we've been using it since 2016. Um, I'm data analyst, I think is my, I don't know what my title is, I think it's data analyst. Um, and if I had to eat one meal for the rest of the year, I would go with sushi. And I'm going to pass this off to Kate. Hi folks, I'm Kate Doran. I work at Flow Analytics um, and we do a lot of work with school districts in Washington and Oregon and we're kind of getting more into Tableau, you know, enrollment forecasting dashboards is kind of where I'm spending my time right now. So not just a static forecast report, but like being able to really, you know, get data from us, but then also be able to like slice and dice it quickly and get the answers that you need. So that's uh, kind of where I'm coming in from flow. And I actually live in Maine. Um, so this is fun. This is the end of my day. This is when I get to hang out with you guys. And I would eat lobster mac and cheese for the rest of the year if I could. 
Um, I will hand it to uh, Susan, looks like the next on the list. Hi, I'm Susan. I am from Highline Public Schools in Burien, Washington. I'm a data analyst. Uh, we use Tableau to visualize our data, among other things that we do. And honestly, this is such a tough question. I have no idea. Like, maybe salad, just because there's like a variety in salads. So you can have like all different kinds of salad every day. So it's not like the same every day. Maybe salad, right? You could put cooked things in salad too, or lobster. Oh, and I will pass it to, let's see, um, Lynn Simpson. Hi, my name's Lynn Simpson. I am with the Bellevue School District. I am a research and data analyst. We used to use Tableau some, and then we now primarily use Power BI. So I'm really just here to learn because I would really rather we use Tableau. So that's what I'm doing here. And my meal, I think, would be spaghetti and meatballs. And I have completely lost track of who has gone and who hasn't. Um, how about Carol Johnson? Apologies if you've already gone. No, no. Um, let's see. I'm with the Carol Johnson with the Kent School District, and I'm a data analyst. And we've been using Tableau for a while, um, mostly just internally from looking at um, tasks that we do and need to complete to do assessment duties, but also looking at data for schools in um, conjunction with our research group who really build the tables for us. Um, and if I had to eat one meal for the rest of the year, it probably would be pizza. Well, yeah. And I have no idea who's next. I just but mean I get to like uh, with Rachel. Or... Yeah, sounds good. Hello, I'm Rachel Waldrop. I'm with the Kent School District and I'm the assessment specialist. And I've been using Tableau, um, fairly new to it, but kind of using it to track assessment scheduling and, and test progress across um, each of the schools within the district to make that easy for district teams um, and building leaders. And um, if I had to eat one meal, I've been sick for the past week, so soup sounds really good to me. So that's what I'm gonna go with right now. And I will pass it off to Lizzie. Thanks, Rachel. Um, sorry, I had a hard time getting off of mute. I'm Lizzie Barker. I'm the Assistant Director of Research here at Kent School District. Um, and the research team has been working with Tableau for uh, a few years now um, and building out our, our data dashboards here at Kent. Um, and I think the last prompt is if you had to eat one meal, um, I think I'm going to keep it vague and stay with pasta. Um, you can do lots of things with pasta per what um, I think uh, was Susan who was set talking about a, a salad or something. You could do lots of things with salad too. Um, also, uh, Kate, I'm originally from Maine too. So I, I feel your, uh, your East Coast connection to the West Coast too. Um, That's great. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and agree with your lobster. Uh, appreciation as well. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Catherine um, now. Uh, Catherine Hinkleman. Hi, I'm Catherine. I'm also at Kent. I guess we have a pretty strong show in here, don't we? Um, I'm a data analyst. Um, <clears throat> back in K-12, I've been here for about a month and a half. Um, if I could eat one thing uh, for the rest of the year, I think I'm going to have to mirror Carol uh, and choose pizza. Um, super versatile, also a carb. So you cannot go wrong there. Um, I'm going to send it to Leon Haskins. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, 
My name is Leon Haskins. I'm a data analyst at Highline School District. Um, I'm trying to think. Oh, meal. I can eat. It would be sandwiches. I was funny. I was just talking to Susan about this earlier. I really like sandwiches. It's something I eat every day. So I think it would be sandwiches. Um, I will pass it to Kelly. Hi. I, oh, sorry. One sec. Like Kelly can't go right now. How about we pass it to Tisha? Good afternoon. Um, Tashawn Christie, Chief of Digital Transformation and Innovation for Highline Public Schools. I've been a Tableau user since 2013. Um, built data systems, data teams, dashboard systems, all kinds of cool things. And been part of this larger group since the Tableau Summit that we had here at Highline. I think back in 2016, maybe, or, or 2017. Glad to, to be back in this space and have some time to be here. So one meal uh, for the rest of the year, I would have cocoa bread and chicken patties from Johnson's Jamaican Bakery and Blue Hills Avenue in Hartford, Connecticut, the, every day. I wouldn't fly there every day, but I'd get enough to last for the rest of the year, and that would be heaven for me, um, for sure. So um, I don't think, I think, hey, Joel, yes, my homie Joel. You just knew Maybe I was going to call you, huh? I, I, I had an inkling. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you for the opportunity. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Joel Bayerano. I serve as the Director of Strategic Initiatives for Kent School District. And if I uh, had one meal to choose, I would choose risotto. I'm going to keep it rolling with these versatile versatile meal options here. I've been really enjoying a, a good risotto and the variety that comes with that. Uh, let's see here. I will pass it to uh, Kathy Gingris. Hi, I'm Kathy Gingris. I work at Kent School District and I work on the data services team. And if I had one meal, wow. Uh, I guess I'll just go with pizza. <laughs> And I'm not sure who hasn't been. Rachel, have you been introduced yet? <laughs> I think so. How about Janelle? Hi, I'm Janelle Gibb, and I'm with Highline Public Schools. I'm a business systems analyst. I don't work um, a lot in Tableau, but I review the dashboards and uh, support the data that goes into it. And then I also refer my end users to Tableau to get some of their data needs met. Um, I would probably do um, cream cheese crab wontons with different dipping sauces. I'm looking through the list here. Is Kelly back or is Kelly gone? I am back. Sorry right. about that. No so worries. I I'm an analyst with Leon and Susan, and I would eat aloo gobi or spaghetti for the rest of the year. Those are my two favorites at the minute. Thanks for asking. All right, now we have our uh, food inspiration for like the next few weeks, right? Not for the rest of the year. And uh, <laughs> thank you everyone for indulging me in that question that's not work related. Um, I am going to turn it over to David for our presentation about uh, course taking and using Sankey charts. I'm going to stop sharing here. Okay, well, thanks very much, Ashley. And uh, now we know if we have to ha have a catered event, it's going to be a lot of different variety, <laughs> even there just in the Kent School District. Yeah. Uh, but I'm really glad we're here today uh, as we try to keep going with our Western Washington Tableau user group and expand. I know that there will be people who watch this afterwards as well, uh, because uh, Tableau is doing a nice job uh, for helping our hashtag data fam uh, learn more about Tableau by uh, recording the Tableau user groups uh, across the nation and across the world uh, that you can go and see on the Tableau uh, YouTube page. Uh, that's where I've been many times uh, to see different groups, uh, whether it's a professional group, a uh, different city, uh, or a Tableau topic. Uh, and if you haven't had a chance to check in with the Tableau analytics group, they're really uh, very informative 
uh, groups to watch. Uh, so regardless of where you are in your Tableau trajectory time, ooh, triple T, it's trying to go for more, but that was a mask again. Uh, you'll find those, uh, I think you'll find those uh, videos uh, useful. And they're all about an hour, hour and a half. And I usually play them on double speed uh, with the captions on. <laughs> <laughs> I've listened to everything. So for those of you out there who are listening to this, double speed captions on, I'm sorry, I've taken up so long. But uh, today, uh, oh, we're going to share with you uh, what we've been doing in Renton with Psyche charts. Uh, and let me share that screen going. But uh, we've started uh, to use uh, Psyche charts uh, in Renton just recently uh, because uh, we had a very specific request. And uh, building Psyche charts uh, can be a bit challenging. Uh, but if you uh, uh, know what to do and have a template to follow, it's something you can do as well. Uh, and we'll save time for questions at the end. So uh, we are Ren, uh, and uh, Tuan Vo is the, was the prime mover here on our uh, Sengi charts, but he wasn't able to be here today. Uh, but we've used this kind of uh, proportion of chronic absence to kind of show you the boundaries of our school district here uh, on the sunny shores of Lake Washington. Uh, and in Renton, when we started our journey, we had very specific core beliefs that we wanted to establish about data and how people would use the data. I'll just let you take a look through them here. But probably the most important one uh, that we think uh, it, uh, is the very last one. And that's only available if you're going to do something with it. So we can create beautiful visualizations and all sorts of fancy stuff. Uh, but uh, we hope that uh, our schools, our building leaders, our teachers are able to use it and do something with that data as well. How we got to Skank Sankey from Skyward. Skyward is our student information system. And if you have a wonderful student information system like ours, ours is Skyward SMS 2.0, we'll probably move to cumulative and upgrade in 2025. Uh, most of the information you get from Skyward is simply in a table that you could uh, export to an Excel. So uh, using Tableau to get more visual is what we're uh, trying to do. Uh, our uh, chief of uh, curriculum instruction and assessment wanted to know uh, what our students course taking patterns were like when they were in an honors course or non honors course in middle school and what they ended up taking in 12th grade. Uh, and for this, there are lots of different ways you could display this data, but we thought because uh, it had to do with a flow and Sankey's are very good at showing flow. And then we could also put filters in so we could have different grades or different types of classes to show those flow and look at a variety. At the same time, we decided to use a Sankey chart. Uh, and you can see that on the right. This kind of information uh, gets better looking, uh, I think, uh, as you uh, can display it in a Sankey chart. Now, Sankey charts themselves are really composed of two parts. Uh, there is the step. Uh, part, uh, which is those individual columns or pillars, you might call it, uh, that are others, other colors than blue and gray. And then there's the path. Uh, and what a Sankey chart basically does is for every individual student, it starts, uh, uh, creates a, a particular path uh, going from, uh, from one pillar to the next pillar, to the next pillar, to the next pillar, pillar or step. So it's a step and path. And each uh, individual has an individual step and path that is in essence uh, uh, kind of like a, a pattern. Uh, you can think of patterns uh, in, in genes or uh, in the human genome and patterns and other things, but everybody that has that exact same pattern will show up in a Sankey chart uh, as of increasing the size of that, uh, that flow, that, that um, next step, which you see is the nice curves there. We learn more about Sankey's uh, by watching videos and uh, following along uh, on these particular uh, ones here. Uh, the Furlage Twins, if you haven't uh, seen them yet or gone to their website, and I'll drop these in the chat. Uh, they're really interesting uh, folks uh, who uh, uh, have a really good uh, job of explaining things. Uh, they themselves uh, are not uh, PhDs in math or anything like that, uh, but they showed us how you could go from a Sankey chart that just had lines uh, to a Sankey chart that had more curves and depending on the mathematical formula that you use uh, can get you more curves and more uh, visually pleasing elements. And that was their description there. And we also use the data flare 
uh, uh, person on their website because uh, uh, that was helpful for us because it really did it step by step and helping us to see what we did step by, how you could do it step by step. In our case, uh, we were getting information from our Skyward uh, and we were trying to get uh, as much information we could, uh, but also uh, from as few data sources as possible. So uh, what we had to do there is we had to use Tableau Prep in order to clean it enough to get it into the version that you can use uh, for the steps and the paths in Sankey. And over here, you'll see we just had three uh, data spots. Let me see if I can turn on my nice uh, control here so you can see better spotlight it here. We just had these three charts that we pulled from our SIS. And again, we're using Skyward. And this is information, or these three reports, I should say, uh, that we get. And then we started to clean it. And over in this area, is what we did is we pulled middle school grades separately and classes separately from high school. And here we put them into different grade levels. So we could have these grade level areas over here for the different steps. And then we put them back together uh, so that they would, uh, we could create the patterns uh, and the little pathways that they would follow. We did something similar here with high school. Uh, and there was one set. And then again, you could see here how we're splitting them up into different grade levels and then adding them uh, together to come with the end flow. They gave us was really just an Excel uh, table, but we uh, you could add as a CSV or a, a Tableau full file to get us the data in the form uh, that we wanted so that we could use it. Oh, oh and this, here's where I could do this next cool part. Get, get out of here to share some other elements uh, of our pieces of parts that we used here. Uh, this is itself uh, the uh, Tableau prep file. And I won't walk you all the way through it as much. As you can see, we did it there by different classes of this. We want, that's how we decided to do it, graduation classes. And to get all the way over, you can do pivots and aggregations in flow. Uh, and using prep uh, made it a lot easier to get to the final area over here, which was just kind of the output that we had at the end. This itself is the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm on a smaller computer screen, so it's harder to see. Let's see if I can go down here in size. Well, I'm gonna be able to do it here right now, but this is the chart itself uh, that shows the flow here. And what we did for this one is we found for ourselves Oh, well, first, let me tell you that it, kind of the two parts. From this, you can choose a different starting grade. So for example, the seventh, you could start at eighth grade. And then you could find out from here all of the folks uh, that maybe started in eighth grade honors courses and where they ended up later. So I have this here, going to eighth grade honors over here. And you can follow their flow where many of them went and many of them didn't go over time. We also have filters built in with our little hidden filter bit here that allows us to look at different grade levels, different grad years specifically, and that sort of thing, which can change it itself. So we could say, for example, let's just uh, take out a couple here. Uh, we will take out some of our smaller uh, elements here. And the chart will change. And the other thing that we did here was when you hover over, when you hover over elements, it tells us the number of students in each path. So you can see which ones start here, how this particular group is built up, and then where they go from there. And that's helping us see uh, how kids end up or don't end up in honors classes. Get this back to here. And you can also see it from the point of view of older grade levels, where if you set it to 12th grade and you want to find out where the students are that ended up in an AP or IB class, we'll pick IB simply because it's higher up here, easier to see. We can track that as well. So these kids, and we only have IB at one school, uh, so this is definitely the Renton High School uh, and where they're starting from and where they go 
from middle school, and those students that run all the way on. To clean up our Sankey a little bit, uh, because it can get, you can get a lot, a lot of these little one-offs and two-offs, uh, we decided to uh, mark our special education and English language arts courses differently because it wasn't as pertinent uh, to this particular task we were doing with, as many of the kids who were in ML courses were in our honors classes to begin with. We just did a show uh, hide on there to either include them or not include them, uh, which makes the chart a little bit cleaner. You could clean it up even a little more uh, from there. Even when you learn to do it, there still remain uh, some challenges in doing a second. It is a bit labor intensive the first time you do it, and it will remain uh, labor intensive uh, as you uh, there's time to clean the data, even when you know what to do with larger uh, Tableau prep files. Uh, it's helpful to make sure you name your steps so you know uh, where to change things around. Uh, we have challenges and people want to know, is this exactly true? Well, it's not always exactly true. Uh, because we still have some uh, course coding data inconsistencies from school to school, uh, uh, or sometimes people have just entered it uh, incorrectly. In this particular Sankey chart as well, we were only looking at whole year courses. So we were looking at the half year courses, which are often um, the electives that kids may take as well. So those aren't in the view. Uh, and then the other challenge we had is that sometimes kids take the same course twice and was we had to make a decision about whether to count that or not and what year to show it. So if they did a credit retrieval for ninth grade uh, English language arts in 12th grade, we decided not to include that in our Sankey chart because it just wasn't uh, pertinent to the particular discussion, which was our kids moving in general uh, from seventh grade through 12th grade. In the future, we're gonna keep going. Uh, we're gonna broaden it out uh, from uh, English language arts. We're gonna broaden it to math, to social studies, to science, to TT, all of our subject areas to see if we can uh, see patterns there. They'll be helpful for scheduling uh, and other discussions uh, with our high schools. Uh, also, we think we'll, we'll probably do something for the graduation pathway for CTE courses to help people see what kind of different pathways people are taking for that graduation pathway requirement we have here in Washington State. And we're happy to, share with you and partner with you uh, our work and our you know kind of our, our base models that if you're interested in doing it the more steps you take uh, uh, the more pillars you have uh, more complicated it gets but again uh, we were able to conquer a fairly complicated one and we're proud of that and, and once we learn how to do it we want everybody to be able to do it and happy to share with you on, on how to do that as well uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now because the next slide uh, is really just uh, for questions uh, and feedback. Of course, Brian uh, Goddard will recognize this slide in my favorite bear slide. Just want to know uh, what questions you have and uh, if there's any kind of feedback you have about how, how it went for you. Hi, David. I had a question. I think I didn't see if I could raise my hand anywhere in the Zoom, so I hope it's okay. I'm just jumping in. Um, this is great timing because we're about to start using this type of chart for the uh, Washington Association of Counties, actually, and they want to look at revenue and expenditure data. So it's interesting to see like a flow of students from like one grade to the next and which programs they're in. I thought that was really cool. But I was just throwing that out there as like another thing that you might be able to do with, um, you know, we're, we want to look at revenue or revenues that are coming into certain departments or, you know, categories and then expenditures from those departments. So that kind of a flow. Um, so thinking about like budget data in a way, not just students, but if you guys have like budgets, you know, and like how things are distributed and, you know, where they're coming in from could be interesting yeah. as well. So I just yeah, kind of want to data, budget data is... that I thought of as well. Uh, we just, mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to get one of the challenging things we have in our district is trying to get other departments uh, to, to get into seeing data visually, whether it's Power mm -hmm. BI or Tableau, we don't care. Yeah. <laughs> so they become better data users, but budget. And the other one I was thinking of, um, is, uh, um, and uh, Sean might like this idea too, is about uh, where uh, assets go, particularly IT assets, like who's got which computer where, which printer, because mm -hmm. uh, they're supposed to be tagged all the time. So you should be able to follow from year to year which buildings they go to and, and that kind of flow if you have a lot of uh, different movements uh, and that way the, the uh, it could be at the classroom level or it could be at the building level, that kind of thing. But yeah, the Sankey charts, I think uh, I've always liked them, uh, and Brian um, 
uh, Brian Goddard started us on the path early because uh, he was just trying to uh, practice with them and doing something um, with which theater schools or which, you know, the high schools. Uh, and then I saw a presentation uh, from uh, your uh, curriculum instruction assessment or directors that will likely have gotten recently an email from uh, OSPI uh, uh, or directly from the ABL uh, learning group. Uh, which is a, a group that uh, is helping high schools with scheduling. And honestly, we, I stole this idea from them. Uh, so instead of purchasing a third provider, I thought, oh, we could do this uh, uh, on how to track how students are going and track. Is there some equity issues there as well? So that's kind of how we got started. Um, but I like uh, additional ideas of other, other uh, organizations, other places that could use the Thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm just going to pop in real quick. Um, and I believe the one thing about this methodology for making a thank you chart that you should be aware of, um, and there's, there's a couple ways to do it. Uh, I did it, uh, when I did it, I did it without the, some of the, the prep work. So Juan and I each came up with our own, own method of making thank yous, but they had, um, one sort of underlying thing that I think is really relevant to be aware of, which is their this design is much better for the many-to-many -many type transitions as opposed to one-to-many. Because a lot of times the other thing we'll do with thank yous, you know, you talk about budget or something like that, where you, you have start with like an initial pot, right? And that's the one, and it goes in a bunch of different directions. Um, or, you know, you'll you'll see a pathway, and I'm probably going in the exact reverse order. Um, I guess this way to this way, is you'll have like, this is what you started with, and it sort of winnows out as different things get stopped along the way. Um, I'm sure there are ways to do that in Tableau as well. I just know that the methods that we found so far have definitely been more in line with many to many as opposed to one. Um, I guess kind of related to that, my question was around like the underlying data structure to be able to allow yourself to do the Sankey for each kind of student and like with all the different pathways, is it one row per student or is it kind of one row per like time period and then um, the paths are kind of built from there? You get it down to uh, the one row per student and that student, we use the student ID and that student then represents a specific path, like how many kids went from seventh grade honors to eighth grade honors to this. So that's one path that they follow all the way through. And you'll see some of them are very narrow paths. Maybe one or two students went from seventh grade honors to eighth grade honors to ninth grade non-honors to a special ed course to dropping out to <laughs> coming back. Uh, so it is one per row. Got it. So that whole sequence is in that one row of data. Awesome. Thank you. I was just thinking about some of the specific use cases and questions that have come up from like our teaching and learning team about um, math and being accelerated in math and where you end up. Um, like if you take algebra in seventh or eighth grade, do you continue on in math and take calculus BC or do you stop taking math in 10th grade? And um, we attempted to answer those questions, but maybe in a less visual way. And this probably would have been a little bit easier to, um, show the end users what was happening there. So just thinking about that. And then also thinking about some of the questions we get about um, our highly capable program, especially as students go into high school and what do they take because there isn't um, a, it's not really its own program at that point. We depend on AP classes, IB, all of that college in the high school. So seeing like what are uh, highly capable students taking and, and all of that. So just a couple of use cases that are immediately coming to mind for me around courses. And I'll drop in the, I haven't done it yet, but I'll drop in the Forlage Twins link as well. And then um, if anybody needs uh, a copy of the PowerPoint, uh, we can do that too. And maybe I'll send it to Tableau folks that can have it attached, or you can contact me. I'll drop in my information in the chat uh, as well. But uh, happy to answer other questions today or offline if they come up tomorrow. Uh, uh, in your brain on a Saturday or however it is, but uh, the message you should take away from us is we, we figured it out and we want to help others use it because we think it's going to be very helpful in, in a lot of different cases.
Thank you, David. Uh, anybody else from the group, any other questions on this one before we open it up more broadly? All right. Well, like I said earlier, the, the rest of this time is really open, like um, asking the group about like any questions, situations, uh, you know, types of data, any questions that are coming up where you're having problems or you're starting to create something, getting some feedback or input. Um, I know we have a few things and different ways we've been using Tableau other than like some of that student data, like the uh, the ABCs and all of that. We've been trying to figure out other use cases and have a few things to kind of share there, but um, opening up the, the floor to any of that. Let people uh, sit with that for a minute. <laughs> well, one of the things that I just recently was working on in it was providing counts to my supervisor on last year's world language um, testing on just total number of students that took the test, what high school they took the test in and the total number of credits earned. It's not a final dashboard, but it was a really quick and easy way to help her see how well we did and the number of students we did, the number of languages we did. And we kept it um, really simple with just looking at counts and really simple tables. And um, once Nick gets back from his maternity leave, I hope to have him help me finish up the dashboard and then we'll start adding in this year's data. So then we can look at two years worth of data to see how are we doing at growing the program. Um, it's really a very simple beginner use of the program, but it really helps to answer a question of how well did we do. Right, it doesn't have to be uh, it doesn't have to be really complex, like in your data set mm -hmm. or your visualization. If you're just trying to quickly convey some information that I think gets lost in a in a spreadsheet, right? Like you can only read so many high level takeaways from an Excel file. So, and and it was really fun linking all of the different um, worksheets together. So you just changed one, and then all it rippled through everything, and they all changed. So you know it. Uh, that in itself is impressive. Yeah. There, there's an entry point for everybody, right? Yeah, I agree. I was gonna say there's entry point for everybody and it doesn't need to get too complicated just to impress or not impress, but I mean, just like help change minds. It's like, wow, this is what it actually looks like as opposed to relying on some of their own suspicions. Yeah, those, those suspicions are often formed by like one or two interactions. I, I definitely had a, a meeting the other day and it, you know, I, I will do all these fun charts, but this one was literally a basic bar chart where I was meeting with a teacher who was saying that not all of our, our students in this class aren't meeting standard. And I pulled up the data and said, well, no, it, it was actually 70%. She was, oh, no idea. Sometimes all you need is that one little visualization just to get people to think about the whole system instead of one or two kids. I was just having that same conversation with one of our uh, executive directors of teaching and learning earlier today. Like what data can we provide quickly and to um, either affirm somebody's assumption or to uh, to deny it, <laughs> you know, like to stop some of those, those narratives from continuing. Like you were saying, like, this is what's happening. Like, no, that's actually not what's happening here. Here is what's happening. So we were talking in terms of um, graduation, people earning credits when they come into the system and all of that, and just thinking how um, some quick visualizations could help with that. So.
I just have a quick general question. I was talking with with Nick about this a month or so ago. Um, how much issue has everybody at the various districts been having with latency lately in, in their Tableau servers? Um, I feel like we, we've kind of gotten ours sped up again, but we, we've been having, had been having some pretty bad issues where a lot of dashboards that are in heavy use were taking almost a minute to load every time. Has I don't, I, Nick was saying that some of his dashboards were having similar issues. Are, are you guys aware of some of these problems too? Or was this something that just Nick and I bonded over getting frustrated about something silly? <laughs> I know in Kent, we have some dashboards that are very complex and like the data sources and that's what's slow and the amount of um, visualizations and all of that, and they're just intensive. So some of those have been slower. I haven't been in there as much, so kind of defer to Lizzie or uh, somebody else if we've still been having some of those issues, but I know it seemed to be a lot of them that were resource intensive, but um, I've been into some recently and they haven't seemed like excessively slower but that's again my my one or two encounters <laughs> i don't pretend to speak for the system yeah i mean i think that there are we have like maybe three dashboards that are like can take a little while to load um i don't know if, it, if they take like a full minute to load um they just are a little bit slower than the others but they are like they have big data sources um, and they have a lot of visualizations and um, a lot of like detail in those visualizations, so, like tooltips, um, tooltips with vizs in them. Um, and I think there are a couple of things that we've done. We did like a health check with our Tableau rep actually, and they really only like pulled out or identified one dashboard that maybe could be more efficient um, it is probably our slow, like one of our slowest ones, but um, but even like when we chatted with them about some of those efficiencies, um, you know, I think that they were more like trying to just figure out how we're doing our joins, cleaning up, using that kind of like the getting rid of like um, fields that aren't being used, that kind of thing um, to make it more efficient. Um, something that we haven't explored too much yet, but could potentially be something to look into is I know that the 2022.3 update had like uh, the dynamic zone visibility. Um, and just like from a little bit of research that I've done on that, there seems to be like potential to support some of that like interactivity or or the visualization piece that's or the activity piece that goes into the visits that might um, speed things up a little bit, um, especially if we have like complex calculations that are going into like the tool tips. Um, but yeah, I think that that's kind of, the health check did kind of help too, because it just talking to our Tableau reps were helpful in helping us like either like recenter or like feel like, okay, here are some like specific things that we could do. Yeah, I know when we talked to the uh, did our health check, we had some some similar things where they're like, oh yeah, best practice is to do this. And I was like, oh, well, since when? And they're like, oh, for two years now. And I'm like, ah, got it. That's <laughs> a, a missed thing. Uh, um, for us, what we what's I think really helped us is we we got the the prep conductor, so the really massive intensive ones. Um, I know, like like I said, when I was talking to Nick, he and I compared our like student profile page type things because mm -hmm. those were obviously the two slowest. Um, and I think offloading a lot of those things to something that historically has, you know, either used a pretty long SQL query or a lot of rows of data per student to reducing that to one row per student did speed up a lot. But I just wasn't wasn't sure if, um, like I said, I, I talked with Nick. I wasn't sure about Highline has had a similar issue about some latency um, or any of the other districts. Kind of like it was only uh, Kent, Highline, Renton, and then someone from Bellevue and someone from Seattle in here, uh, but I'm just kind of curious what everyone else has been dealing with. I haven't seen it a ton, um, but um, there are some that seem to work a little slower than others. 
And I think the things that I always kind of verify, and this might be because I've been using it since way back. There was always that, um, I don't know if it was an urban myth, but about um, fixed sizes for dashboards, help them load faster because the database stores every possible size and has to remake it when depending on the screen size and all that type of thing. So um, I always try to default to that if there's a problem with speed. Um, but also go in and actually look at the report so that you can see exact numbers because all the reporting is in there and it tells you how long it takes for specific pages to load and then start to troubleshoot from there because maybe some of the queries can be more efficient, you know, or maybe um, you can use the the hyper engine a little bit differently internally to do refreshes and those types of things are what I start to look at rather than getting too deep into the data architecture of the thing. Thanks everyone for your insights as well. Yeah, good tip about the size, big size. Anybody been getting any different types of requests for dashboards that are outside of the normal student data scope? Um, I feel like I'm always interested in hearing ideas there because while we're by no means done, I feel like we have a good handle in Kent on those types of dashboards. Um, always more questions to answer, more nuance and people asking more and more, but kind of expanding those use cases outside of that. And if you've had any traction in any of those other spaces. Some of the work that I've recently been doing is uh, with surveys uh, and then uh, we have family surveys to get help from Brian with the uh, use of uh, Gantt charts. Uh, to display the, the information there. Uh, but also, uh, sometimes I haven't gotten to the step where I need to put it in Tableau uh, because I've been doing a lot more cleaning work in Tableau prep. And for those of you who haven't used prep, it's really helpful and visual. And I could show you a quick thing if you wanted to. But uh, sometimes because uh, of the way prep displays the data, uh, you can answer your own questions uh, just by the bar charts they provide you in prep. And I'll, I, I'd probably help them just to see an example. So I'll just drop the example that I have here. Uh, I've been working on, uh, this one is to figure out uh, where uh, students who have more recently entered the United States, where they're coming from and how much help uh, different schools might need uh, with transcript um, uh, translations or helping understand uh, different places, uh, you know, uh, how to provide appropriate credits when they enter. Uh, and so I just pulled a, uh, 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 some uh, fields from Skyward that I thought would be helpful, uh, then went through it to change some date areas. And this one loads relatively quickly because um, uh, it's not as big a file. Uh, oh, don't need to see the name, so get rid of those. And uh, just kind of sorting on uh, different areas. Let's remove this now. And when they enter and when they withdraw. And so uh, the nice thing about when you start working with this one is you can say, okay, how many people were there for four years and where did they come from and which schools are impacted or pick the school and say, okay, how many different uh, countries are they coming from uh, and where are they going to and, and that sort of thing. So just uh, because it provides this nice visual uh, element here, and you can just see a lot more uh, just by clicking around uh, within here about kids from Latin America. Uh, and this was a big cleaning step uh, to clean out uh, from lots of different names uh, uh, into, and here's an example. Uh, so we had all of these uh, students uh, coming from uh, a school within the Puget Sound region. Um, and you had to, I had to clean up some of their data in here to put them in bigger categories. Uh, so just the Washington Puget Sound one, we get kids uh, from other countries that come to us, but before they come to us, uh, within four or five years of graduation, they've been to all of these different places in the Puget Sound before us. So this is the kind of a, a fun bit, I think, uh, for how 
for me at least for how Tableau Prep can help me answer questions before I don't even need to put it into a <laughs> sometimes I don't even need to put it into a, a dashboard. Just, I think like uh, with the survey piece, we've been doing some of that as well for like our different like student surveys and um, and our climate surveys and all of that and been trying to do um, put those on Tableau public as we can so that they're transparent and the people that are taking the surveys can see the results back and you know see what's happening. Um, I think we've also been doing some work of taking qualitative data and being able to like quantify that and come up with like in surveys like find the themes and be able to quantify this theme came up this many times and um so that we've been going through and collecting some of that qualitative data and being transparent about that too because um i know before we were asking a bunch of open-ended questions and then um be like well what are you going to do with that are you going to code it you being whoever you know <laughs> created the survey and it's like well i i don't know so just kind of in line with all the data literacy pieces, we've been having a lot of conversations with teams when they're creating surveys about survey design, best practice, and what you wanna be able to do at the end of the day. And we end up uh, talking people out of a lot of open-ended questions, not because they're not good questions, but because they don't know how they're going to be able to go through and analyze all that data and do anything with it. So, um, we ask that question a lot, like, what will you do as a result of having like all of that open-ended data? And if they can't immediately answer, we're like, all right, maybe it doesn't belong there. And really trying to talk about limiting to one or two of those open-ended questions. And then talking about other ways to get qualitative data, which kind of goes out of this space, but like using focus groups, using interviews, other data collection methods, if we want to do that. But, um, but also just trying to broaden this type of survey data that we're showing and presenting back. Do you have an example of how you uh, visualize? I, I, I totally understand what you're saying. Like it's hard to work with that more qualitative, freeform survey data. Um, do you have any examples of how you have, you know, whether that's uh, a, a way of of sort of organizing the data, getting, you know, pulling out key ideas from that people are talking about? Um, do you have a good example of how you've done that? I see Liz yeah. is unmuted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was actually going to say, um, I can share out. Let me see. Um, so here's like an example of. Um, can you see my. Oh, wait. Oh, can you see my screen? Okay. Um, yeah. So here's an example of like a, a dashboard that we or uh, a survey that we kind of supported there. We've supported their um, quantitative questions over the years and in, in putting that into a dashboard. Um, but last year when they administered it, we also helped support like the interpretation of their qualitatives, like their open-ended responses and doing some visualizations for that. Um, and we helped to integrate it into our website. So this is the web page for us that, that shows um, kind of like the background for our student equity and inclusion survey from last year. They're still conducting the survey this year. So um, moving forward, we might do like an update to this page. Um, but then we kind of like think about putting down some like key takeaways. Um, so we do have like a full dashboard on our public site that shows like the results of the quantitative, more quantitative questions in the survey. Um, but these, um, kind of synthesize some of the information from that. So there was one question about uh, student belonging. Um, and so we were able to capture that through like a, it was on like a Likert scale, I think, like how much do you feel like a sense of belonging? So we were able to capture that, compare it across two years of the survey administration, um, and then show it in here in kind of like a mini like dashboard view. Um, and put in a little bit of like text to interpret the, the results. Um, but we also took the qualitative themes and put it into like another little dashboard view. And basically what we ended up doing was kind of like coding 
these big themes and then sub themes that went along with them based off of the student responses. So we could show like the percentage breakdown of like which was the most popular like top 10 themes or the sub themes that would go with that. Um, and we were able to use, I think in this view it shows, um, we also like kind of pulled out like the biggest changes across our Likert questions. And we're using like the notes to point out some changes over time too that were specific to those questions. Um, so this is kind of like a different way that we normally do our dashboards because um, we essentially ended up making like a series of like mini dashboards um, that we were able to host in our website. Um, and we're able to kind of put in a little bit more context and story, narrative story than we would normally put into a dashboard. Um, but you can still like kind of have a little bit of interaction with these views and see the, the tooltip for a little bit more detail about the questions themselves. Um, the qualitative, like the qualitative responses were essentially like the process of pulling these into a visualization did include like us going through and coding um using some of that like qualitative uh analysis um and coming up with with the the codes um based off what we were reading um and then just kind of aggregating that into its own data source um yeah okay. and it, it looked like um so 213 responses or students uh 156 responses so in that case are you saying that those ones were sort of like hand coded or did you do any kind of, okay. Yeah, so we like went through and basically like read the responses, hand coded them, and then um, just like tallied I up the codes. I, I, I yeah. was afraid, I was like, oh, maybe maybe kids come up with a cool like system. Oh, okay, yeah, hand coding. Yeah. So one of the things that we have learned um, that might speed up the like hand coding process is, um, I mean, there's a bunch of like coding, like qualitative coding software that's out there. But one of the cool things that we learned about SurveyMonkey this year, because we administer the survey through SurveyMonkey, is that they've built in a feature where you can create your codes ahead of time and kind of like go through and like tag, basically. Um, and I think that you'd be able to export them um, as well. We haven't like dug into it too much. Uh, we've just started like playing around with some like early responses. Um, so that is like something that you could keep in mind too, if you have like codes that you think of in advance, um, rather than like going in, coming up with the codes, doing kind of that like, you know, inductive coding um, approach, like you can like go in and tag and hopefully like export those tags so that you'd be able to like aggregate them um, better. Um, so that might be something to explore a little bit more. We can give you some updates <laughs> once we've played around with it a little bit more too. Yeah, and SurveyMonkey has started a bit with their language AI as well. So they'll, uh, you can have SurveyMonkey codes, uh, uh, small things like positive or negatively uh, answered. I uh, can't remember, there's another uh, kind of binary pair there. Uh, but I, yeah. I'm, I'm hoping that in the future, things like SurveyMonkey or Paul Tricks or whatever, will use natural language responses to, to create codes for us. Or maybe we just throw them into chat GPT and ask them <laughs> yeah i mean the coding that they also have in there is like you can create your own codes too so it's not just like a yeah, sentiment analysis it's like addition in addition to that you could you know create your own essentially like a tag for it um which is cool that they've added that feature in there um and there are other like i think like atlas ti and other software is out there that does sentiment analysis too and i think you can like like an online subscription to Atlas TI is pretty low cost too. And that is one of the reasons why we limit the amount of our open-ended responses also. <laughs> um, and we've been pretty clear in having conversations with different teams that, you know, we have two data analysts and Lizzie, like that's the research team and the, um, we asked then for some friends to help us with coding if they really want to go down that route. Cause I mean, there were 150 there, but we deal with things that are bigger than that too. So uh, how can we uh, spread that love and, and build up the capacity of our other teams to do things like coding and some like general data analysis too, given 
how big our district is and how small some of our teams are. So, and if you know, one of the solutions we used to uh, a solution we used to rent to do that is uh, we provided the after we completed our family survey, we provided the code themes area that we had identified uh, and then gave the themes so that uh, schools themselves could put them in areas. We never asked them to put it, give it back to us, but we preloaded some of the themes for them. Uh, very simple things, similar to the, the larger ones that you got in yours, Lizzie. Things like uh, security, uh, belonging, uh, uh, physical security versus emotional security, those sorts of things. Yeah, and I will say that like, I think to Ashley's point about like trying to teach other teams like these skills as well. Like I will say that in working with the team that we do for at KSD for um, the equity student equity survey, they've really like taken a lot of like our discussions to heart and they've revamped the survey. They were the ones who were like starting to explore the survey monkey tools too. Um, and I've really started to take on more of like, uh, you know, more of that ownership in terms of like making the survey their own um, too, which has been really cool to, to work with them about on, on that project. Soon we'll have them building their own dashboards and- Right. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Any other use cases in dashboard land that have been coming up? I don't have another use case, but I do want to uh, do a shameless plug uh, for the upcoming WIRA conference. Uh, I am the WIRA data visualizations uh, special interest group uh, titular head or the guy who organizes things, and we're having a share your data visualization. Uh, it doesn't have to be Tableau. Um, uh, a chance for up to nine different schools. We have three so far, uh, our districts, uh, to share visualizations that they've created and want some feedback on, or just want to show off some of their stuff. Um, so uh, let me know if you have a data visualization you want to do. Yet you do have to be present uh, at the meeting, but if you don't want to be present but you do want to share, uh, I can share your stuff too. Um, so that other people can see some of your work, but you may or may not want to give me access to the people. <laughs> we create some more work than just coming for a day, and it's March, uh, March 2nd and 3rd, March 2nd and 3rd in Tacoma. It's coming right up. We'll, uh, we'll be there. We have a, quite a few people coming from Kent. Well, I think it's something you guys want to share. I haven't received your survey response yet. <laughs> Did you say you had another use case too, or just? No, I was just doing okay. a shameless plug. Okay. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I can share a use case that I've had. I've kind of been using Tableau more for just exploratory data analysis, mm -hmm. just because the main um, was. Uh, because all kind of the production uh, dashboards are all done through Power BI instead but i can usually work a little bit faster in tableau just because that's where my prior experience was um but one thing that i've done uh with eda that has been helpful is um using parameters to put in the different types of disaggregations so you can actually set up um like a dashboard um and then set the parameter to choose which field to disaggregate data by and it helped to um kind of what is it set up one kind of normalized structure that I can use to just um, have multiple different looks uh, so this dashboard was looking at testing rates for our fall 22 map window and we were kind of curious about if there were differences in testing rates at different schools um, and this is for six through um, six through eighth grade uh, math map testing rates and essentially so this is kind of if you were to just look at things across student or sorry um schools as a whole for all students um but with the disaggregation parameter so we have our african-american male students which are our focus students as well as students of color furthest from educational justice and 
from there, you're able to see kind of the disaggregations um, just by kind of choosing. And then if you want to look at um, students with IEPs, for example, you can also click through here. And this just kind of helped to just do a quick scan of ac across schools. Are there kind of consistent disparities that we're seeing across testing rates? And like, are we also seeing it across like multilingual learners? are uh, black male students or our students with IEPs. Um, and yeah, there's also the ability to look at it across like all race ethnicity. Um, and yeah, I don't know if other folks have kind of used parameters in this way, um, but if it would be helpful, I can show you how to do it as well. Yeah, that's really nice. I like how you can drop down and see the different uh, bits there, uh, particularly with um, the uh, students receiving special education services, that sort of stuff. Yeah, students with IEPs, that demonstrates it well, the different <laughs> who's getting tested, who's not getting tested on your benchmark tests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Can you say a little bit more about the colors that are there and what they indicate? Yeah, so it's generally kind of like two sets of colors. Um, basically a student that is like a student that has IEP is an orange. Uh, mm -hmm. They don't have an IEP, it's in blue. Um, there is an additional level because there are kind of six focused middle schools in our district that are getting targeted investments. So that's kind of the, the additional um, kind of color that's within there. Um, but basically gotcha. these uh, blue schools are the six. So kind of added that second layer of coloring just to be able to see that um as well is the expectation that they're all at 100 percent um that was the hope where that's that was kind of the expectation going in but this was also the first year that yeah. um, middle schools administered the test um in not not only just the fall window but also just in general um for math so um the actual testing rates were better than i think what folks were anticipating um, but definitely hoping to get it closer to 100% come the spring administration when we do the second cut. Now you have a clear baseline, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Now we have some information or some more data. Um, yeah, if you Brian, are, bring this to Wira, you show this one on Wira. So I like your use of the uh, vertical 100% um, and the small dots and that sort of stuff. I can, mm -hmm. like you're good. And it doesn't have that much information on there to, uh, to embarrass anybody. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I actually reached out to our business intelligence team, which does um, like the primary data or a lot of the production dashboards as well. Um, so we'll see if there's something that we uh, can bring to Wira. Um, if you are curious about how this is set up, uh, basically, you just need to have a parameter set up. And that's basically the drop down that you choose. And then you just need a calculated field um if you're able to see this where you just set the different values and you can put a different dimension across each one or a different dimension that's connected to the parameter and then that allows um sorry and then there's one more step which is to actually put that into either the color element or into like your rows or columns and then that allows uh, the dashboard to kind of be dynamically uh, disaggregated um based on the parameter That was my that was my like quick really? dashboard use. How that beautiful. Is that yes, that in the calculation. Sorry, what Sorry. was that? Uh, that calculation, can you show me again one more time? Uh, it looks yeah. like there were two parameters in it, not just one. Or why was there purple? I, I... Um so this one is oh. the parameter. So this is like the value of the parameter. Oh my God. My eyes just have gone blind. That says oh, yeah. equals school. For yep. some reason, it looks like it was in purple, and I thought it was a per separate parameter called. <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's uh, definitely I'm going to go to the eye doctor after today, and uh, <laughs> you can all uh, make fun of me. <laughs> no problem. It was definitely a, a small piece of text to try to read quickly. Thanks for sharing.
I'll say one uh, place that we're going into or revisiting is um, access, uh, teacher access for our dashboards. So our teachers don't have, some of them do kind of on a, a one-off basis, but generally it's our um, school and district leaders and anybody that's in a school-wide role, like a counselor, a specialist, somebody like that, that has access right now. Um, we were really getting into that prior to COVID and then, uh, you know, priorities shifted. So it's coming back now, but I think one of the things is like, we have a lot of dashboards. So I think some of our users think we have a bunch of dashboards to share them with teachers. And it's like, they were designed for teachers. Like they answer questions at a different level. Like some of them could be, you know, changed fairly easily, but just wondering if any of you all like, if your teachers have access and what those dashboards look like or the different things that you considered while building those dashboards, because yeah, it's not as simple as just putting a teacher filter on. It is on some of ours, but not all of our <laughs> dashboards. I can maybe speak to the general for rent and then maybe Brian can speak to some of the specifics because he's actually in the process of redesigning some of our dashboards and they look really nice. At least I think they look really nice. So, uh, so uh, in the general, we uh, uh, it was first kind of a cost issue uh, to have more things out there. But when we got server and of core, we thought, okay, we can open it up. And because we still have the row level security, um, we are able to, people will only be able to, uh, uh, row level security through our active directory, uh, people will only be able to see the students that are assigned to them uh, in uh, through our student information system. Um, and we built some things that were for everybody. We put them in a, a folder called general, and then we built some things that were for uh, administrators only. Those tended to be things uh, either where teachers may not care or <laughs> where we also uh, also provided more detailed information about uh, individual teachers uh, uh, because uh, our uh, group didn't want teachers to see other teachers specific data, but the administrators needed to see their individual teachers data uh, for them in their school. Uh, and just this year, as we're trying to get more people to use it, we have a lot of dashboards as well. But just this year, we uh, put out a, a kind of a home screen uh, through our Tableau server uh, so that people would be able to see uh, dashboards that were pertinent to them. Uh, and so this is a new home screen that we have here uh, for people uh that uh also allows people to go into the explore function and the my favorites function uh if they have that for tableau uh, but instead of seeing a long list uh of things they can uh go to the ones that may be more interesting to them so this just counts the number of dashboards that we tagged ourselves as saying it's related to behavior or attendance uh these sorts of things and then we also tag them to our strategic initiatives uh whether uh, around these so as you click on these different ones the number of dashboards changes. You can see that below, uh, and they has uh, ones that are uh, released and unreleased. And you can see those sorts of things change there. Uh, and the ones in blue, I can't remember which ones are blue versus gray. Blue is uh, it's kind of the administrator stuff, the blue ones. And so just to kind of see who's got uh, access to what. The gray ones are the general that everybody could see, uh, and the uh, blue ones are the ones that are specific to uh, people who would be able to see all of the teacher information and that sort of thing. So that's what we did uh, to try to reduce the visual uh, amount and make it easier to find. I can't uh, say that we necessarily have more use, uh, but hopefully at least uh, it's easier to see. And Brian, did you want to speak to any of the kind of stuff around uh, teacher I mean, versus uh, all I say to the, the teacher access, we, you know, we've been struggling with this same thing as long as you guys have. Um, we currently have teachers able to see their students in, I think, four or five dashboards. Um, as long as we've had it, we've never gotten any real traction. Um, this year, what we're doing, which we're hoping will sort of shift to getting more people to start looking at the data is um, around grading practices specifically. So we're not, 
we're not taking, we're putting in, you know, things like discipline, attendance, all those things. We're leaving that to the administrators and counselors and, you know, data teams, all of that. Um, but for teachers, what we're trying to do is grant access based on PLC. So teachers can log in and see, you know, and we're starting with elementary where it's really easy because it's a grade band, you know, all of the fourth grade teachers at a school. And we're having, we're trying to have it set up so that they can log in and say, see how all of the fourth graders in their school are doing, um, broken up by teacher to sort of give them a reason to look at the data and talk about the data. Because historically, it's always just been like, okay, in your PLC, you know, you'll have a data team where, you know, maybe your AP will come and they'll share the, the data they want you looking at in Tableau, filled with your grade, yada, yada, yada. And so what we're trying to do is um, getting, so we're starting with uh, BAST and iReady, or Fondos and Pinnell and iReady, getting people to look at their grade bands and broken up by teacher to sort of have the teachers talk about their own students. Um, we can report back hopefully at the next meeting if it is working because that should get rolled out here pretty soon. Um, and we'll see if we start seeing teachers log in or if this is just a pipe dream that we, you know, I, again, we've, we've been trying to get teachers to log into Tableau for four or five years now, and it's not doing that, so. Well, I think like there's such a big like training lift, right? Like, I mean, you could just say, hey, you all have access and like, well, I don't know what that means. I mean, you'll have some people that are naturally curious and like more data savvy and they'll, they'll go in and do that. And it, that's always been our caution and like talked about like readiness for schools to consume that information. because so we have like 3000 teachers. So like going into saying, here you go, you all have access to, <laughs> to vision, our Tableau like dashboard system. Um, I'm not sure what we would get. And then we talked through, like, even if we turned it on all at once, what, what would we be prepared to provide in terms of training, all of that? Um, but we talked about this idea of like readiness and really part of that being centered around like the, the principal and the instructional leader and their like ability to have conversations with their staff about how they want it to be used and all of that. So I was just wondering what like communication goes along with like, Hey, you have this access now here's what you can do or and who's kind of championing that and i think the reason why i'm hoping i'm, I'm hopeful for once that this might work is this is sort of it, it is top down but it, what it's coming from is chief of elementary uh chief of elementary and chief of school improvement which are the two chiefs overseeing all the elementary schools have basically said they they really want the plcs to start looking at their data more often and as opposed to just saying, okay, you guys got access, figure it out. We're making specifically dashboards for, hey, this, this is how you can look at your, you know, Fontes and Manel data. This is how you can look at your iReady data. And we're gonna send that out to all the elementary school principals to make sure they know how it all works. And then they can push it out to their teachers and say, hey, in your next PLC meeting, you guys gotta talk about where your students are at, you know, in reading, in math. Here's some dashboards you can look at. Um, ideally, I think making some like guidance, you know, I've, you know, we've had David make little videos of clicking on things before. We'll probably make David do a walkthrough of this again that he can push out. Um, but I'm, <laughs> that's, what, that's why we keep him around. Um, that and for, for bear pictures. Um, uh, so hopefully by making it like, you know, two dashboards, hey, you are expected to be looking at this. Your principal is expecting you to be able to talk about your students and your colleagues' students. We're hoping that that might get teachers to realize, start to realize, hey, we can understand the data we're looking at. And then from there, maybe push out more things as questions. Yeah, I think Brian uh, highlighted that those, the two elements. One is the expectation, right? That these professional learning communities, these grade level teams or subject matter teams are gonna be looking at data and then narrowing what they look at, because we've had PLCs uh, for a long time and it's always been look at the data, but who knows, nobody really uh, kept track of what they were considering the data they were gonna look at. And so in this case, then it's 
you get these two dashboards to choose from. <laughs> and so make sure you're looking at one of these two dashboards. Uh, but that will, I think, uh, with your comment, Ashley, bring some of the uh, uh, needs to a head about data literacy. Like, how do I read this? How do I function with it? What are the things that we can do with this? Uh, which we're welcoming uh, to have and hope to have more. We'll have to have more of. Yeah be interesting then too like I mean you can see who's accessing the dashboards and how often and be able to see like are we seeing differences in outcomes or who's doing what and being able to follow up and all of those pieces and we can use Brian's chart Brian King's chart about oh which person <laughs> access, the teacher use? <laughs> who's, <laughs> who's access the dashboard from each school <laughs> uh, no I think that makes a lot of sense like that it's tied to something like it's tied to like an initiative like you have like stakeholder buy-in at several levels that uh, can kind of keep that at the forefront. And I think that's really important that, that it's anchored to something. Um, I have a question about that. Do you guys have like any kind of like, I mean, I guess that there's this expectation is like, here's the two dashboards you can look at, but are you guys going to do any kind of like follow up or have any plans to do follow up like observing a PLC or something like that? and um doing any like follow up with your your chiefs to like see if like they're actually accessing them beyond just like looking at what the the um view rates are in the dashboard too that's a great question we should probably <laughs> have a plan for that huh <laughs> yeah no i think um that we'll definitely need to do some kind of follow up it's it's kind of hard um, to know exactly how we would do that um, beyond, you know, again, like you said, there's, you, you can look at the view counts, but that doesn't really tell you anything, you know, other than, hey, this teacher has accessed it 30 times because their computer kept crashing, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, so I think we, we would probably have to talk to the chiefs about like, you know, and it, it's going to be one of those fun top down back and then pull back up. Like, Talk to your principal what feedback are they getting from their teachers and you know try to hey maybe we'll make a survey and then we can we can code it and <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly so yeah we'll we'll probably have to figure out a plan on, on how to uh, get feedback on that yeah we, we haven't always been as proactive in renton about uh, uh thinking about uh, program evaluation uh from the start and so we do a lot of uh, uh, retooling based on uh, what sometimes is called as viz as backwash, right? So the feedback that you get after you launch it uh, and people are saying, oh, this and uh, our Brian's conversation before around the challenges we had with some of the loading in our Tableau server was we found out that some people were using, because uh, we weren't really keeping track, but some people were using certain number of dashboards every single day. And they're like, why is it still broken? Why is it still broken? Why is it still broken? Uh, which is really heartening uh, to us. It's like, wow, they really rely on this a lot. That's terrific. Um, but we haven't done as much as let's go out and find out uh, why people are using it, what's use, who's using it, how can we do more speaking from uh, the crowd, which is uh, a good way to do it. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was just wondering in part because like we've been trying to weigh out like what our entry point is too. Like if we should try to like find a group like an MTSS group or something like that to start working with to say like, okay, like in part, like to assess like, you know, the feedback on what their experience is, but also to help inform like how we adjust dashboards too. And like what questions are, data questions are from the beginning um, rather than us trying to like imagine what they would want for um, specific scenarios too. Well, that's exactly that's... what we did with our EWIS dashboard. Um, and I have a, Brian, I was sharing with Brian all the time. I was like, oh, yeah, uh, this set of slides I have is how our EWIS dashboard has changed over time. Mm -hmm. um, from so this very simple one that almost like, a like an Excel spreadsheet to well, much more complicated ones as we got better with Tableau and, and seeing that, that. But we really relied on the, the small teams that we had that we were working with, the EWIS team, to say, what do you want to see and what do you not want to see? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I think, um, sorry, David's uh, made my brain turn off for a second. Um, that whole idea of like getting them to ask the questions. So I've, I, 
I've sort of struggled with that lately. I, whenever I schedule a meeting with somebody, I will, I, I try to get them to like, hey, what are the questions you are trying to answer? And I, I feel like it's, it can be hard for me to get people to sort of imagine a new question than just, hey, this dashboard you made that one time, can you add one more filter to it? And I'm like, well, is, is there a different question you're trying to answer? Are you trying to, no, just, can you, and so, um, yeah, getting that, getting people to actually think, talk through like what questions they're trying to answer and like understand that, hey, we're ready to move forward with something new. It, we, I've, I've had trouble getting people uh, comfortable with that lately. So if you have a good way to get people to actually like respond to those questions with like, these are the questions we're really trying to answer. And this is how I imagine looking at it and understanding it. I'd, I'd love to. So, figure out a way to get people to respond. Yeah, and I think like in fairness, I, I don't have like a good answer to that either. So I was curious about like how you all were approaching it in part because like, I think we can, we're either on like one side or the other where we have like users who don't know what question to ask because they haven't like gotten into the tools yet or like users who've like become familiar with the tools but wish it did like this one other thing. So like, could you add this filter? And per what David said in the chat too, like there's no one dashboard to rule them all because like everybody has different things that they want to use the data for. So yeah, it's like, and then right, you know, kind of keep track of like all these different like filters that would serve different needs too. I do feel that what has been most effective for me, even if it's not perfect, has been, and my, my problem with it is, you know, you guys are, twice as big as we are in Renton. And I already feel like Renton might be a little too big for this to be done by one or two people, um, is just you know making a bunch of dashboards, omitting them up on the site, but then you go out and have all these meetings with people and just talk through them you know, one-on-one -on -one and get them to start like playing around with the data, get them to ask you the questions as they're looking at it. And then, like David said, you, know, you augment, you keep moving forward. That has been our most effective method to actually get people to one, get the to the questions they're actually trying to ask, and two, get comfortable with the fact that they are data more data literate than they're giving themselves credit for. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, the problem with it is, you know, there's two of us here. There's, uh, I guess, uh, there's David as well. David sort of has a separate role, but there's two of us analysts here, and there, we have 30 schools. And I get, like I said, you guys are both both are all of the districts here are bigger than us, so it's really hard with that limited capacity to go out and have those one-on-one -on -one meetings and get people to be comfortable because I feel like it's something that when you do a group training no one really wants to be the one to be like hey I'm confused by data I don't I'm not comfortable with numbers and talk through until they realize that's just a story that they have about themselves and it's not really true. We um, in 2019 um, we were going out to schools in earnest. Like we uh, we put out like in our, um, we have like a weekly kind of leadership update that goes out to all of our leaders. And we just put out like an article that was like, hey, we'd love to come and talk to you about data. Like, you know, we have our dashboards. Do you have any questions? What's missing? Like just really broad. Cause I think we had, um, we had like the core dashboards like done and, uh, and we had like a bookings page and people just signed up and we had a, a lot of interest. And, you know, it was the people that were were interested, but it was that captive audience that we could start with. And uh, we had some good conversations like and I think it was easier, like you were saying, Brian, and that like more one on one, like it was like me and a data analyst and a principal. And maybe they'd have their AP or somebody else like having the conversation. Here's how we're using this. Here's what's missing. Um, and Bill was like. We're not going to make all your changes probably, but you know, now we have a conversation. We understand how this is being used. And our next phase of that was going to be to go to the schools that we didn't hear from. That it was kind of like, this isn't really an option. We talked to the people that were excited. Now we're going to talk to the rest of you. <laughs> like, and why aren't you using it? Do you have some other structure that already makes sense? We want to know. Um, and I think that's what we're picking back up on now um, that we're in a different space, but I think it's harder to like to get into more of that nuance like after you do have like the main questions taken care of like to like what else is possible and um what else could we do that is outside of this grades um 
attendance behavior space or like how do you ask more sophisticated questions about it because um, i feel like we've added maybe more layers to our dashboards like we haven't gone we have updated things but then we've also have like i feel like we have pages that start out really high level and then get very specific like so um but those have been i think based on some of our users that are further down the path and and can ask those questions but Getting out into schools has been, I think, all of that to say really helpful. And we just carved out the time to do it um, and, and made it happen. And I know it's a priority again this year now that school's back in and, and people are using data, like have all those groups and committees together. I also feel like it's a priority that, you know, we can make those of us who are a little bit further down the pike where we've, you know, got a bunch of stuff already up there. Um, as opposed to when you're when we were first starting out and we just needed to get some dashboards up there yep. so people could answer basic questions. Now it's like we have the time. We're like, okay, well, we only really need to update a couple dashboards and then we're then it's a lot of just maintenance and then there's a lot more time for those conversations. Brian, other, what's the oh sorry. But the other thing that gives me heart is the um the questions we don't get anymore. So we kind of know to some degree that uh, people are using them. They maybe not use them as much for everything that we hope, but the questions we don't get anymore and, and or the questions uh, that come to our student information services office that we can simply answer by pointing them to a mm -hmm. tab dashboard. Whereas before we would have to run a report for them or this, that, or the other. Um, now we have fewer kind of basic questions like how many EL students do we have or things <laughs> or things. Uh, because we can simply uh, point them in that direction uh, 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 of the, the dashboards that we have built. Yeah, I was just going to ask Brian, what's the usage like in Seattle? Because you're like the the biggest group here and have the most. Uh, I don't know. There's just a lot of schools that are in very different spaces. So I was wondering what the the usage is like. Um, yeah, I think similar to a lot of what folks are saying, I think a lot of the dashboards are designed, like there's real level security to allow kind of teachers to be able to access data for their specific students. But I think the majority of the dashboards that are being used are the more like school leader level dashboards. And I think one of the other kind of challenges is there's a lot of different spots where folks can kind of access similar data. So with all the different assessments, there's kind of the platforms from the actual like assessments themselves, which I think are kind of used as, or are kind of like the first spot that I think educators are going to for the data. And there's been, I think some attempts to like build out certain platforms uh, for like the teacher level, uh, which haven't really been successful. I think just because it is harder to get people engaged with the tool. Uh, once it's built, uh, more so than actually setting up the data in a way that it can be accessed um, by folks. Um, I know that this year there was someone added to the business intelligence team, which maintains a lot of the dashboards to do uh, kind of like coaching or to be available for uh, coaching. And there are also um, like coaches in the different content areas as well. Um, which I think also provides one way to engage with like educators on the different data available, but I'm not super familiar with like how successful or how much folks have engaged um, with the different dashboards because I think we all like even for like school leaders, um, we run into issues with just people not being aware of the availability of the data within the dashboards. They'll have questions and kind of like ask for tools that already exist. Um, so I think even amongst um, like the audiences that are using the dashboard more, it's still hard to, I think, um, just make people available or aware of everything that's available. And the yeah, other thing that I, I'm wondering, and, and I talked with Brian earlier, is that we might add to our dashboards. So people still want the Excel table out of it. <laughs> Give me the Excel table. So I saw one school district just puts the Excel link right there all the time. It's like, you want the Excel of all the students? Here you go. Uh, like, oh, they want the board. I don't know, but maybe it just makes it feel more comfortable, something they can use. Uh, so we might start putting more Excel buttons. Like, here's the download of the student list exactly as you as uh, it would show up in Excel if you were to run this report yourself. Yeah, we do that too. I think we. Um... You know, we resisted for a while, like, why do you need that? You have it here. And then it was just like, you know what? It's not hard to add it. So here you go. If you want to use it, use it. 
we had some schools that were like, well, we want to be able to add our own um, data into the, the spreadsheets. And we're like, well, once you download the, the data, then it's like, it's dead. Like, you know, like it's not updating. But then it was also this balance of some of what they were adding is not captured anywhere else. So we can't add it in the dashboard. So it's like, well, if that's the stopgap for now, okay. You're using the dashboard and getting 90% of the data and then adding the other 10%. And I think that's part of what we're thinking through too. How do we capture some, some more data? But then there's kind of the question of like, what does belong in like dashboards and being collected centrally versus uh, living with a teacher or at a school and not being put in anywhere else. So um, I think we're, we're trying to find that balance and also just saying, okay, if you need this thing, all right. <laughs> but tell us more about it so that we can try to meet you a little bit further down the road. I was just gonna go back to the, um, you know, it's hard as there's like turnover in schools, like with leaders and all of that and onboarding, like letting them know that these resources are available and what that looks like. Uh, we try to like catch the new like principals and administrators, like we see they're coming in. Hey, welcome. Like if you ever wanna look at data, you're brand new, you wanna know about your school, here's what we have. Uh, but that's kind of like manual on our part and <laughs> reaching out um, a little bit easier for building administrators than like teachers. So, you know, what does that look like and how is that built into onboarding and potentially partnering with HR and some other pieces there? I appreciate this conversation. Some of, as some of the people are here have been doing like work in Tableau or Power BI for so long that it's not necessarily about building the dashboard. Sometimes it's like, then how do you get people to use them? Which is just as important as building the dashboard, but a different conversation. Well, thanks for bringing us together. I hope we continue to have uh, times to bring together and broaden out our, our groups. Uh, if you know others that might be interested, feel free to invite them. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I've invited from people from other states before. I don't think anybody from another state came today, but uh, oh, it was uh, the young, uh, woman from Maine came today. So that's oh, true. Yeah. We're Western Washington, but and friends, right? Yeah. 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 I think we're trying to get back on to that uh, quarterly. You know, we usually meet like every three months. So that puts us in like, I'm like, when does that put us? April. April. Perfect. After spring break, you know, all of that. So, um, for me, like look for a survey coming out about times and all of that. We'll try to keep that top of mind. And um, yeah, I appreciate having the mix of like having like a presentation, having time for conversation, but you know, whatever people are working on and willing to share, and we work around what what's happening and relevant. So. Yeah, I really appreciated the conversation at the end. That helped a lot. Got some ideas. They're like, all right, more Sankey charts coming to you next time. Uh, <laughs> somebody else's version. Yeah. Well, uh, if if we're at a good stopping point, I'll give everybody the next 17 minutes back to uh, do whatever you will on this Friday afternoon. I haven't been outside. I have no idea what the weather's like, if you like want to go outside or not. <laughs> like, somebody have a window? What's <laughs> It's like a little gray, but it looks pretty clear. <laughs> All right, great. It's, it's still light out, right? <laughs> we'll have light after 5 p.m. today, so. Okay, well, that's good. Yeah. Be out of here before 5. That's my goal. <laughs> oh, David gave us a window. Oh, yeah. All right. Perfect. Look at you with a window. That's exciting. <laughs> when did you go home, David? <laughs> oh, I went for all of us still on recording, my wife needed the car. We got one car, so I had to come home. Okay. And I still work.